Hey there, marketing analytics students. In this video, we're going to introduce and illustrate the application of prediction model validation. Our learning objectives for these videos is to understand the types of data sets that we use in predictive model building and validation process, to understand the idea of overfitting and underfitting a prediction model, and understand why we use a training data set to build a prediction model and a validation data set to actually select which model to use. We're also going to be using Rapid Miner for all of the illustrated examples here. We're mostly going to be using operators and techniques that you've seen used in previous videos, but there'll be a few small new wrinkles. Let's introduce the scenario that's going to motivate all of our examples. Our goal is to see if we can build a prediction model that predicts U.S. adults' beliefs about the healthiness of genetically modified foods, or GMOs. Specifically, we're going to try to distinguish between two types of people, those individuals who think that genetically modified foods are less healthy than non-GMO foods, and then those individuals who think genetically modified foods are neither better or worse, and in a few cases, actually better, than non-GMOs. Research has shown that in the United States, opinion on this matter of genetically modified foods and healthiness is approximately split. Now, the reasons for why different everyday consumers believe that genetically modified foods are either healthy or unhealthy far exceeds the scope of this presentation. For our purposes, though, we just need to understand that it could be useful for a marketer to know whether or not the kind of person that they're uh, marketing towards either has a positive or neutral attitude towards genetically modified. We're going to use a 2018 publicly available data set from Pew Research to investigate this issue. There's about 21 potential predictor variables that we could use to try to predict people's attitudes about GMOs. Some of those are consumer beliefs related to science. Some of those beliefs are related to people's health and diet attitudes and beliefs. We also have some demographic information. Here's a list of all the variables that we could be using. I just want to draw your attention to our dependent variable, the GMO belief variable. We ask people, do you think foods with genetically modified ingredients are generally healthier or the same? There's also two other variables in our data set that are about genetically modified foods as well, whether or not people read about them and how much they care about the particular issue. For this tutorial, we don't want to include these, the, these variables as potential predictors. They're a little too close to the actual issue of GMO beliefs. So we don't think that would be a very useful variable for a marketer if they're just simply trying to identify individuals related to their GMO beliefs. It'd be the equivalent of thinking that if we see someone eating a pizza saying yummy, 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 we could use that to predict whether or not they like pizza. It might have strong predictive power, but it's really not that useful for any marketing application. You're going to need to download three different data sets and get RapidMiner ready to go. There's three different Excel files, a training data set of 1,000 respondents, a validation data set of 500 respondents, and a scoring data set of 775. You can also import the rapid minor process file that you'll see on the next slide here. As a first step, let's just read in the three different Excel files using the read Excel operator and rapid minor. We're going to use this training set to build our prediction model. We're going to use this validation set to test and evaluate our model. And then finally, we're going to apply the predictions from our final model onto those individuals that we haven't directly observed their beliefs about the healthiness of genetically modified foods. And don't forget, when you want to run this rapid minor process file on your machine, you need to change the file folder location of where the Excel files are. If we run the rapid minor process file, we'll see that the training set shows the first thousand respondents, and we do in fact have their GMO beliefs, their dependent variable. For the validation data set, it's a different set of respondents, but we also know whether or not they act, what their attitudes about GMOs are. And finally, for our scoring data set, everything else about the data set is exactly the same in its structure as the training and validation data set, except we don't know what these individuals are going to do. That's why we need to build a prediction model. We want to predict whether or not we think that they, these individuals think genetically modified foods are either worse or the same as non-genetically modified foods. Okay. Our first step is that we need to build some prediction models. First, we're going to construct a prediction model using the training data set. How are we going to do this? We're going to use a decision tree to build our prediction models. We're going to build 14 models in total, from simple to complex. How do we vary this level of complexity in our prediction models? We're going to vary this by changing something called the maximum depth of our decision tree. There's a lot of different ways that you can take a prediction model and make it more or less complex. This is just the one technique that we're illustrating in this example. Let me illustrate what I mean by maximal depth when it comes to decision trees. Take a look at this simple example here. 
To figure out what the maximum depth of this decision tree is, I start at the top node and I work my way down through the different nodes looking for the absolute longest chain that I can find. And as I work my way through, I realize there is one spot where once the node depth reaches four, we, read our we reach our final terminus. There's other pathways that are shorter than this, but this is the maximum one. So this particular decision tree has a maximum depth of five. If we had a maximum depth of six, seven, eight, or more, that would make the decision tree potentially more complex. If we had a shorter maximum depth, that would say maybe only two or three, we would have a necessarily have a much smaller decision tree, meaning a much more simple model. Hence, by varying the maximal depth that we allow the decision tree to have, we actually vary the complexity of our prediction models. Okay, with the idea of maximum depth explained, we're now ready to actually set up our prediction model. First, let's take a look at the select attributes and decision tree operator. We're using the select attributes model because we don't want to use every single one of the variables in the data set that we read in. Remember, there were two other questions about genetically modified foods that we said we didn't want to keep in as part of our prediction model. By selecting all of the other variables in the select attributes operator other than these two, we can ensure that those two will stay removed from our prediction model. For our decision tree, we simply drag the operator over, and I just want to draw your attention to how I set this up. I turned off pruning and pre-pruning. This isn't typical, but it makes it a little easier for us to illustrate the concepts we need to learn today. Notice that there's a parameter for maximal depth. This is the number that we're going to vary as we create simple to complex prediction models. After we build our prediction model, we then want to see how well it performs. In other words, what's its overall accuracy? We do that by bringing over the apply model operator and then the performance binomial classification. This performance binomial classification operator is how we get our confusion matrix and how we determine our overall accuracy. Now, I actually ran this process 14 different times, changing the maximal depth from one to 14 and documented the results. Let's take a look at just a few of those selected 14 models. For an example of simple complexity, I set the maximum depth to two and our overall prediction accuracy was 66%. Here is the decision tree and we see that people's attitude, and here we see that people's attitude about the role that science has played in food has a strong impact on whether or not they think that whether GMOs are the same as or worse than, than non-GMO foods. Specifically, notice that if people have a mostly positive attitude of the role of science in food, they're much more likely to have an attitude that, G that GMO foods are neither better nor worse than non-GMO foods with regard to their health. At our moderate complexity level, I already lose the ability to easily show you what the decision tree looks like. It's enormously complex. So you want to go check that thing out in RapidMiner yourself. But I want to draw your attention that our overall accuracy has improved to 73%. In extreme complexity, with a max depth of 11, again, the decision tree, I had to reframe it, and it's impossible to show on a single chart. Our overall accuracy has launched all the way to 97%. We are very good at predicting who does and doesn't think that GMOs have worse health than non-GMOs. This chart is very telling. Notice on the x-axis, I've plotted the depth, the maximal depth for each one of the decision trees from one to 14. So more complexity is on the right-hand side, less complexity is on the left-hand side. On the y-axis, I document the overall predictive accuracy of each one of my models. And I simply plot that line, the numbers you see at the bottom. Clearly, as we add more complexity, our overall predictive accuracy improves. At this point, it might lead us to conclude that our more complex decision trees are the best ones. After all, our predictive accuracy approaches near 100%. But let's wait before we jump to that conclusion. Remember, that's our overall accuracy for the data that the decision tree actually saw while it was building its own predictions. The real question is how well that prediction model will work for data that it hadn't seen while it was building itself. Let me illustrate this by a simple example. Imagine we have a training data set, images of three cats and one dog, and our goal is to build a prediction model that predicts whether something is a picture of a cat or not a cat. Voila, our prediction model does a perfect job of predicting what's a cat and what's not a cat. However, what happens if we take that same prediction model and try to apply it to an entirely new data set, a data set that it didn't use while it was building itself? It's entirely possible that this model would have 0% accuracy when it tries to validate itself. In other words, 
our training model built a model that predicts things well for that, that which it saw, but it did a terrible job of predicting novel new things that it didn't see at the time of training. And it's this 0% accuracy in the validation process that's actually important to us. This tells us that our model isn't any good. We need to apply this logic to our GMO prediction mo model. So that brings us to our next step. Now it's time to validate our prediction models. So we're going to take those 14 models that we built during the training phase, but we're going to apply those models onto predicting the validation data set. And remember, the validation data set represents 500 records that the model wasn't shown while it was actually building itself. So we're going to find out just how well it does at predicting results when it didn't see the data during the building process. Let's look at how we're going to set up this model validation process here in RapidMiner. Again, we're just going to use an apply model operator and the binomial classification performance operator. The difference here is we're going to take the model coming from the original training data set, but we're going to take the data from the validation data set. So this is the data that's going to be predicted using the model that was built on the training data. So we're very interested to see how well it's going to perform on this unseen data. This is the exact same chart that I showed you earlier with the training data, but this time we've also plotted how well the performance, how well the predictive accuracy of our model performed on the validation data set, those 500 records. Notice there's a huge difference in the performance as we move from less complex to more complexity. On the validation data set, at first, as we add a little bit more complexity, our model performs better and better. However, there's a point where there's a discrepancy between what happens with the training data and the validation data with respect to overall accuracy. Around six or so, we see that actually as we add more complexity to our prediction model, the model became worse at predicting the validation data set. This is despite prediction accuracy improving with the original training data set. This shows us that our model has become overfit once we pass a certain level of complexity. The model becomes good at figuring out how to predict things on the training data set, chasing after noise, spurious correlations, and the like. But when we try to validate that model on data that it didn't see, all of those spurious correlations or random noise weren't present in this new version of the data set, and it actually hurts our overall prediction. Thus, it looks like a dip of three, four, or five is approximately the good balance zone, meaning a place where the amount of complexity in our model is rewarded with meaningful improvements in our overall predictive accuracy. Thus, we can use the validation data set to find that sweet spot. So this teaches us an important point. Complexity in our prediction models is good so long as it rewards us with better predictive accuracy on data that it wasn't trained on in the first place. Let's take a look at this concept of overfitting and underfitting one more time using the traditional graph that's used to illustrate this point. Again, on the x-axis, I have prediction model complexity, less complexity, and more complexity. Notice I'm not talking about decision trees in particular. I'm just talking about any type of prediction model that can be less complex or more complex by adding more and more parameters to it. This time on the y-axis, let's look at prediction error. So as we go up the y-axis, we have more error, which we don't desire. And on the bottom, we have less error, which, of course, we do desire. When you're building a prediction model using a training data set, you'll see a shape that almost always looks like this. As you add more complexity, the prediction model will have less and less error, approaching near-perfect prediction. However, when you take that same model and apply it on a validation data set, you'll almost always see this U-shape. Your error will decrease for a amount of time, but at some point, the model becomes overfit and actually gets worse at predicting on the validation data set. In this zone, we have what are called overfit models. And on this zone, on the left-hand side, we have an underfit model. Underfit model simply means we could indeed add more complexity, meaning more predictors, more parameters, and we would in fact be rewarded with a genuine improvement in overall prediction. 
This middle spot here, we're at the near bottom of the U shape, is where we have our good model zone. And of course, the lowest point in the validation data set, where our error is the lowest and our overall prediction is the highest, that would be the ideal model. Now remember, we do have one other data file that we haven't used yet, the scoring data file. If we plotted the scoring data file onto this same chart, what would we expect the results to look like? We would expect the results to look something like this. Notice that on the scoring data file, the curve follows the same shape as the validation data, but it has even more error at the same points of complexity than the validation data set. What in the world could be going on that would account for the scoring data set to have even more error even if we select the right model. Keep in mind, for the scoring data set, this data set represents the future. The individuals who we genuinely do not know yet what their beliefs are or what their behavior is. In marketing analytics and marketing prediction models, that scoring data file usually represents a future period of time, whereas the data that was used for calibration and validation was collected in the past. And that usually explains why we expect to see some small discrepancy between the validation data set and the scoring data set. Things change over time. Our consumers act differently, they feel differently, competition changes, the marketing environment switches. So even though we might have a good model based on the validation data set, which is often from the past, when we build that when we apply that same prediction model on our scoring data file, there's other things that have changed that probably means our model won't perform quite as well at predicting in the real world. This is a natural drift phenomenon that often occurs. And also keep in mind, this for this scoring data file, we don't yet know what the people actually think or actually do or how they actually behave. Thus, this dotted line is strictly hypothetical at this point. We only can have an expectation of what our overall error is going to be. We have to wait a certain amount of time to actually observe what the real behavior or belief is when we actually collect the data. At this point, we've trained our prediction model and we validated it on a different data set. This helped us identify which of the competing models at different levels of complexity were most desirable. We're going to use that. Now that we have our model selected, we can use that model to make predictions on our scoring model. That brings us to our final stage in our rapid minor process file. Notice all we're doing here is we're bringing in one more apply model operator taking the same model that we built on the training data file, bringing in our scoring data file and merging them together to apply the predictions. And of course, don't forget that your decision tree operator has to have its maximal depth set to the model size and level of complexity that we desired. In our case, we decided that a level, a maximal depth of four represented our ideal model. And again, it's a bit too complex to really see in a slide so go inspect those results in Rapid Miner. We can see the application of our scoring model on our scoring data set here. Again, we actually do not know what, some, what these individuals' beliefs are with regards to genetically modified foods, but we can still make predictions by applying our model. For example, for consumer 9006, the model predicts that the individual think that genetically modified foods are neither better or worse the non-GMO foods, and it was 61.2% confident in that prediction. For consumer 9010, so what did we learn in this tutorial? Importantly, we learned that the task of model calibration and model evaluation should be performed on different data sets. We learned that if we use training data alone, we will often overfit our models, leading to needlessly complex models that also do a poor job at prediction in the real world. Finally, and related to point number two, we saw that the use of a validation data set can help us find the sweet spot for a prediction model, balancing predictive accuracy and model complexity.